Let's talk about some of the nitric oxide synthase enzymes, right? There's three main enzymes. Can you kind of break those down and the roles of each of those? Sure. There's NOS1 is neuronal NOS, and this plays a, a big role in the central nervous system. So then there's NOS2, INOS, inducible NOS. This NOS gets upregulated by inflammatory reactions, infections. And then there's ENOS, NOS3, endothelial NOS, and this NOS lines all of those blood vessels. So the, the NOS and the ENOS, these NOS, they, they produce the nitric oxide in spurts, unlike the INOS that kind of gets upregulated under inflammatory conditions. And that just um, can produce, you know, large quantities of nitric oxide. However, to be able to make this nitric oxide, these NOS enzymes have to be coupled. So NOS enzyme is a dimer and it's held together by BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin. So under oxidative stress or inflammatory conditions, a lot of times that BH4 is oxidized to BH2, so the NOS becomes uncoupled. So when NOS is uncoupled, it's a superoxide producer, not a nitric oxide mm. producer. So in some of these instances where they say that you know the NOS is being stimulated, well, is it coupled and is it really producing nitric oxide or is it producing more superoxide and making more oxidative stress and causing more inflammation like that way? Because superoxide is one of the most powerful free radicals that we produce. It creates a lot of destruction in the body. And so if it's uncoupled, if the, the uh, I guess, the, the inducible nitric oxide is uncoupled, then it's going to ramp up the amount of superoxide production, the overall amount of oxidative stress that the body is encountering. Right. All, all of the NOS, if it becomes uncoupled. It just, Any one it, of them. It's yeah. a superoxide generator, right, which then causes yep. more inflammation. Right, right. And so you said that first one is the neuronal uh, NOS, right? It plays a role with the, the nervous system. And you've got mm -hmm. the inducible. And you said that goes up when there's chronic stress, infection, uh, or other things, maybe toxins that are helping to drive up inflammation. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Right. And then the third one is the endothelial NOS, which plays a role. That's the one that we think of when we think of dilating the blood vessels. And it also plays a role in lymphatic function as well, correct? Right. Right. Lines all those lymphatic tissues. So when you're nitric oxide deficient, your lymph's not moving either. You know? Yeah. Most people don't don't remember that part too. That yeah, lymph yeah. Yeah. Clears it, a lot of toxins. And if you're nitric oxide mm. deficient, not only are you not clearing them, you know, through your kidneys, through your your blood, you're not clearing them through your lymph either. Yeah, that's so important to know because lymphatic function is is critical when it comes to overall health. And so for a lot of people, when they're under stress, you were talking about how that will drive up that inducible uh, NAS expression. Can you can you kind of go through that pathway again? Well, actually, stress uncouples the NAS enzyme. Mm, okay. Okay. So it's so, an uncoupling agent. Yeah. Yeah. So stress increases oxidative stress. So it's uncoupling that, that NOS enzyme. So that's why when we're stressed, we get sick easier because that INOS is uncoupled mm. and making your nitric oxide to attack the pathogens. When we're stressed, we have more cardiovascular complications, more high blood pressure, more strokes, more MIs, because it's uncoupling that ENOS. Mm. Okay. And is that the same thing that infections and toxins are doing? Are they uncoupling it as well? Yes, they are. They are. And so um, a lot of 
like a lot of times when you you read all these studies and they talk about how um, all of these toxins and the these infections they're in they're stimulating NOS, in particular INOS. And they talk about a molecule that's called peroxynitrite. Right. So peroxynitrite is a molecule of nitric oxide and superoxide. However, and then they they blame all this tissue damage on this peroxynitrite molecule. However, you know, they can't even measure peroxynitrite. They, They are measuring a molecule called nitrotyrosine, and they are just assuming that peroxynitrite was there. But there's other molecules that can nitrosate tyrosine. So the nitric oxide scavenges the superoxide. Because only a, a free, free radical can scavenge another free radical. However, peroxynitrite is O-N-O-O. Nitrate is NO3. So in fact... There are studies showing that 90 to 95 percent of the peroxynitrite isomerizes to nitrate, which is inert. So there's other. It, it's I think it's from the increased oxidative stress and the inflammation that's causing these issues, not necessarily from the increase of nitric oxide. Mm. Yeah. So that's important to know because. Basically, the the inflammatory process is going to uncouple the nitric oxide, which is then going to cause more oxidative stress to build up in the system. It's like a vicious cycle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what are some signs that, like, what are some some signs and symptoms that somebody may have that could clue them in that they are not coupling their nitric and producing nitric oxide at adequate levels? Any kind of any kind of chronic issue, your NOS will be uncoupled. Age, by the time you're 40, that NOS is only functioning about 50%. By the time we're 60, it's only functioning about 15%. Hmm. Lack of exercise. EMF, and we're swimming in the sea of EMF, hmm. increases oxidative stress, uncouples that NOS. Medications. Antibiotics, azole antifungals that are used a lot for for mold issues, and like the SSRI and antidepressants, birth control pills. So that's why they don't like women over the age of thirty five, you know, taking the birth control pills, and especially if you're a smoker. NSAIDs, your ibuprofen, naproxen, and PPIs. Mm. EPIs interfere with the production of nitric oxide through both pathways, through that NOS enzyme and the nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide path. Stress, big one, stress, uncouples that NOS enzyme. Genetic SNPs, you know, you might have some NOS SNPs. Any SNPs in, in like the oxidative stress pathway. If you've got any MTHFR SNPs, you are by definition nitric oxide deficient, and that's about 40% of us. Because when you've got some MTHFR SNPs, you're not able to, to make that BH4 adequately. And remember that BH4 is what couples that NOS. So that's why supporting the nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide pathway is so critical. Because not only are you increasing nitric oxide through that pathway, the nitrates help they increase the production of an enzyme that makes your BH4. So you're helping to recouple that NOS. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about that pathway. Nitrates are something we get from our diet, something that we can consume in different foods. Can you break down that that pathway and the different foods, for example, that are high in nitrates? Sure. We consume the nitrates. They get absorbed. They circulate around. They get concentrated in the salivary glands. 
salivary glands release the nitrate. We've got good bacteria on, on the back of our tongue in the crypts that can reduce that nitrate to nitrite. We swallow the nitrite in the acidic environment of the stomach. Some of that nitrite gets reduced further to nitric oxide. Here's your protection against E. coli, H. pylori. But most of the nitrite gets absorbed and acts like a nitric oxide donor molecule. So different tissue can take that nitrite and make nitric oxide on an as-needed basis. Like when you're exercising, those myoglobin in the muscles can reduce nitrite to nitric oxide to increase that circulation there. The electron transport chain can reduce nitrite to nitric oxide on an as-needed basis, like under hypoxic conditions, to help open up those little microcapillaries in order to allow oxygen to get to the cells. So, that, so what are the main foods that we're consuming with nitrates? Um, arugula has yeah. the highest nitrate mm. without any oxalate issues. Right, low oxalate, yep. Right, but spinach does. Uh, celery, beets, bok choy, butter lettuce, a lot of those dark green leafy vegetables are high in nitrates. But arugula is kind of the magic one because you don't have to worry about any any oxalate issues mm. there. Because a lot of people that do have some chronic issues, they're not clearing those oxalates easily. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so when we're looking at it, we're eating foods like that. And then our bacteria on our tongue um, are, are helping break down the nitrate to nitrite right. compound. And then the nitrite goes into our stomach. We got to have good stomach acid. And that acidity helps with the conversion into nitric oxide. Right. So that that's why those PPIs, mm. the PPIs interfere with that nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide pathway. Yeah, those are proton pump inhibitors. Yeah, and like basically are. they block your ability to produce stomach acid. Right. But they also increase the production of a molecule called ADMA, asymmetric dimethylarginine, which inhibits that NOS enzyme. Hmm. So th those, those drugs, those were one of the first things I'd get people off of. When they were first put on the market, they like insurance only paid for like a six week supply. And now they've been on the market for a couple decades. They're over the counter. People have been taking them for years and years hmm. and they're causing all kinds of issues. Yeah. And let's talk about like people take, for example, a lot of people use mouthwash and different things like that. How does that impact the bacteria in our mouth? that are helping us with this nitrate to nitrite conversion? So anything that interferes with your microbiome, mm. any antiseptic mouthwash, some fluoride toothpaste. Fluoride is antibacterial. If you're using some whitening toothpaste, the hydrogen peroxide, antibacterial. So anything that's interfering with your microbiome can interfere with that reduction of nitrate to nitrite. So, mm. and if you've yeah. got dys dysbiosis of your gut, you know, all of our microbiomes are connected. You know, if you've got dysbiosis of the gut, you know, there might be some dysbiosis of your oral microbiome. However, the beautiful thing about nitrate supplementation is with continued nitrate supplementation, you are rebuilding your microbiome. Mm -hmm. The gut, the mouth, the skin, the brain, the urinary tract. Everywhere there's a microbiome, nitrate helps build up that. 